Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I invite you to please be seated. An interesting fact that you might not know about me is that I am a huge science fiction nerd. If you have books or movies or TV shows that you've loved in that genre, I want to hear all about them. (laughs) I recently, this week, finished a book in the genre that I can't take my mind off of. It is just very compelling. And I'm not going to give away the title or anything in case you come across it because I want it to be a great surprise like it was for me. But I want to tell you vaguely a little bit about the plot line. It's about a man who's on a solo space mission that's very important. And completely unexpectedly, he comes across another spaceship. And it's something unlike he's never seen before. And he wonders how life could even be supported in such a spaceship that's shaped like that. The science he knows doesn't support that. But sure enough, after waiting and watching this ship, the ship starts to signal to his ship, starts to signal that it wants to connect with him. And of course, in this moment, he has overwhelming emotions. Curiosity, of course. But there's this huge sense of fear and danger. What if this spaceship just wants to come on and fight him or completely annihilate him? And reading that part of it made me realize that so much of our popular imagination in books and movies and conversation about imagining what encountering extraterrestrial life might be like is bound up in fear and violence and a lot of boundaries. It's like the us versus them sort of saga. But the pleasant surprise about this book was that that was the complete opposite. These two, this this alien life form and this man, soon discover that they are both on solo space missions. And they figure out how to connect their spaceships, they figure out how to communicate with each other, they even form a friendship and end up saving each other's lives. It is such an inspiring and empowering story of breaking down all barriers, crossing borders for the sake of love and connection. And that's all about what Jesus is about, especially in Mark's gospel, crossing borders and breaking down barriers. We hear a lot that Jesus gets in the boat with the disciples and goes to the other side. And in today's gospel, it says, again, they get in the boat and they go to the other side. So right before this, Jesus and his disciples had gotten into the boat and gone to a Gentile territory. And Jesus had performed a miraculous healing and cast this demon into a herd of swine. And it was remarkable and it was life changing. Then again, they get in the boat this morning and they go to the other side. And this time, they're in a Jewish territory and they're immediately met by the leader of the synagogue, Jairus. And he is desperate for his daughter to have healing because he, she is at the brink of death and he doesn't know what to do. And of course, Jesus immediately says, yes, I will go and see her. So Jesus and the disciples immediately start going towards Jairus's house. An interesting thing about the Gospel of Mark, a tool the writer employs, is that he'll often have a story within a story. And biblical scholars sometimes call this the Markin sandwich. We hear about story A, and then we get interrupted by story B, but then, sure enough, we're going to come back to story A. So we're interrupted by story A here, Jairus' daughter, by the hemorrhaging woman. Because as Reverend Alex already displayed in his story of this, this woman is desperate. She has been suffering and hemorrhaging for 12 long years. She has exhausted all of her resources. She has gone to doctor and she is in pain and certainly excluded from many aspects of society. And I imagine she is lonely and desperate. 
But in that loneliness and desperation, she also has courage and she has faith. She has courage enough to reach out and dare to touch Jesus's cloak, believing that that could make a difference for her. And sure enough, it does. She is immediately healed and the miraculous thing about that is that Jesus notices too that something has happened, that some energy has gone out of him. And he swirls around in the crowd and asked who that came from, who touched his cloak. Such a ridiculously seeming thing to say in such a crowd of people where there's lots of jostling around and bumping into each other. But he knows that this interaction is different. And miraculously enough too, this woman could have run away, she could have chose more isolation and more pain, but she chose to also have courage and to confess to Jesus that it was her, that she had reached out and she had asked for healing and received it. And Jesus didn't respond with violence or confrontation, but he responded with compassion and understanding. That intimate term, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And then we get back to story A, the seemingly important story with the high-standing synagogue leader and his daughter. And before this interaction with woman B, the hemorrhaging woman, ends, people from the house have come over and say, don't bother, Jesus, don't waste your time. She is already dead. And Jesus has no time for that because he knows he has an important mission and he shoes these people away. And when he gets to the house and sees all the mourners and the criers out, he also sends them away. And he takes this intimate group of people, his close disciples and the girl's mom and the girl's dad, and comes in, takes the little girl's hand and says, Talitha kum. And this is an interesting part of the story because this Talitha kum, little girl, get up is a preserved Aramaic phrase in the text that didn't get fully translated to the Greek or the English. The, the writer really wanted us to see how simple these words were. Talitha kum, little girl, get up. This, this healing was, was through no magic word or anything beyond Jesus. It was Jesus through God performing the healing, giving this girl breath and new life once again, welcoming her back into life and society. Now these 12 years that this girl had lived, she gets to live more. And these 12 years that this woman was suffering and in pain, she gets a new lease on life, welcomed back into society so that she can know God's love and Christ's love for all of community and herself and themselves. And it's all interesting because it's bound up in this theme of crossing boundaries and breaking down barriers that get in between us and the love of Christ. It was seen as unheard of to kind of touch someone who was bleeding, or touch a dead body. Yet Jesus entered in anyway, and he did it because he knew his mission was for healing, connection, and love. And that was the most important thing in the moment, and that changed their lives and everyone's lives. And this Mark and Sandwich, this ABA story, I wonder if the writer used it to break down the barriers between people of seeming importance and less importance to say, we all have equal and elevated status in the love of God in Christ, and we are all called to love each other. Break down barriers that get in between that. This week, you might have heard that Dean Matthew and Reverend Jim have been at our International General Convention. It is a triennial, every three-year legislative body that gets together and decides important matters for the church. And they've been really busy this week. <laughs> and one of the ways that the barriers have been broken down in our church and life together in Christ is that our communication has gotten a lot faster. Usually in times before, in decades past, when you wanted to learn about what happened at General Convention, you had to wait for the physical newsletter or you had to wait for some of your clergy or lay deputies to come back and tell you all about it. 
But in this day and age, some of you might have witnessed that we've been blessed with a live stream, we've been blessed with immediate internet articles and people's commentaries on social media, and slews of pictures and hopeful videos about what's been going on. Now I could stand up here for hours and tell you about the hope that happened there and the joy and the breaking down of barriers that get in between the people of God and community. But I wanna highlight three and then maybe you can go home and research some more because it's good stuff. The first is that this body passed an amendment to our catechism and you can find that in the back of our red prayer books. But this part of the catechism is on holy matrimony marriage. And instead of the words that are printed in your prayer book saying that marriage is between a man and a woman committed to a lifelong commitment with God and Christ and each other, this edit reads that marriage is between two people, more inclusive language for that lifelong commitment of God and Christ and each other. And that was a resounding yes from those bodies that they wanted to make that change. The second hopeful thing that I found out is that the Episcopal Church in Navajo land has been, uh, has been classified as a missionary diocese now. And that is a really hopeful thing because if you don't know, the Episcopal Church in Navajo land was formed in 1978. And that was from indigenous reservations in the area, in New Mexico, Utah, and Arizona. And that was a way to organize the church and help those communities thrive. Now in the past, those bishops and those leaderships have been guided by the, the higher up bodies of the, the House of Bishops primarily and appointed bishops through that body. But this change gives that diocese authority to elect their own bishop, just as we elected Bishop Megan five years ago. And that is a wonderful, hopeful change for those grassroots leaders to really develop the community of Christ right there in their midst. The third and final hopeful thing that I saw that happened was a massive gathering organized by a committee known as Bishops Against Gun Violence. And those bishops, along with the youth presence at General Convention, organized a huge march in Louisville, Kentucky, where the convention was, with signs and great voices of hope, calling for an end to gun violence that has shattered our communities, our schools, our churches, our lives together. And they have called for justice, love, and healing in the midst. So Jesus is all about breaking down borders and barriers and anything that gets between us and the love of Christ and each other. So today I invite you to think about how you are called to cross borders and break down barriers and stand for each other and stand for those who are the lost and the least so that we can come together and show God's love and be God's love in the world.